My name is Daniel Maloney. I'm the, the Mayor of Ballarat. It's really fantastic to be here today. I'd like to start by acknowledging our traditional custodians of land, the Wadaron people of Kulin Nation, and uh, pass on my love and respect to one of the most beautiful cultures and oldest cultures on our planet. Um, we are lucky to be here. Um, we pay respect to the Wadaron people, their elders past, present and emerging, and uh, recognise their, their connection to the land and the waterways. And I extend that love and respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. I'm also so blessed to be part of a community that is becoming increasingly a, a lot more uh, multicultural and seeing so many new wonderful um, cultures just sharing of, of their food, of their song, of their dance, of their stories and their language. It's just so inspiring. It's why I, I love living here. Just this week alone, I was talking to Yvonne and our, and our speaker beforehand, to Terry, that... Uh, just this week, I think I've been to Irish, Indian, Aboriginal, African, I'm probably forgetting a couple others, a few different uh, events as part of Harmony Fest. And uh, I take my hat off to our intercultural team, to Francis, Yvonne, uh, and others as part of the team. So thank you so much. And Dave, thanks very much for part of, being part of this wonderful team that's getting uh, some great celebration of, of our wonderful, diverse community. Um, today, though, I want to pay particular respects to our African community. Um, it, it, and it's great to see everyone here that's part of this inaugural event that's, that's, uh, that the Ballarat African Association's rebranding uh, African Australian Identity Project. The Ballarat African Association is a non-profit, non-political, non-religious and charitable membership organisation and since it was formed in 2006, the Ballarat region has witnessed an influx of African families from overseas, interstate and metro Melbourne and uh, now uh, impressively, the African population, uh, at least of the adult population above 18 years, is in excess of 2,000 people. And that is actually seeing such a, an incredible sharing and vibrancy across every element of our society in terms of food, sport, entertainment, uh, the skills brought as well to, gosh, yeah, even now, <laughs> Presenter Michael is such an in incredibly skilled uh, chemical engineer or mechanical engineer there. So thank you so much. Uh, today we'll hear from a panel of local African Australians um, as they share their stories, uh, discuss their contributions to society and explore our common human aspirations. So led by Ballarat African Association President, Dr. Michael Lekindaju, the aim of this event is to address the common misconceptions and stereotypes about African Australians and to celebrate their vital contribution to our society. So please uh, join me in welcoming today's panel. I'll uh, ask uh, Dr. Michael Lekindaju to uh, join us now and uh, introduce everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor of Ballarat. It's been wonderful to have the opportunity in Ballarat to be able to display and share the skills and the uh, contributions that we bring to, to the society. Thank you so very much. Um, I was uh, saying earlier on, it's immense how much and how many uh, events you have attended that I have been to as well, uh, that I've seen you had since January, you do deserve a break. <laughs> we'll invite our panelists to please come to um, this stage. Father Constantine, who we all know, uh, was born in Nigeria, West Africa, and migrated to Australia in 2003. He works as a Christian religious minister in Ballarat and a present chaplain at Langakai Tuala. Constantine's interest in working with people on the margins of the society motivated him to co-establish the One Humanity Shower Bus uh, to provide hygiene services and hope, to, and hope to the homeless of Ballarat. His passion includes building community and social bonds as a way of creating harmonious and coercive society. Constantine has educational qualifications in philosophy, theology, community development, and counseling. You will hear a lot more from him. Welcome, Constantine. Aranla Akenebosum. Aranla is a scientist and a youth mentor who believes everyone's voice and talent is pivotal to creating the world of our dreams. She has worked extensively with youths of various backgrounds 
and understands that each person's experience is unique. Arunala enjoys the process of supporting young people through their journey as they rise above prevailing circumstances to unleash the potential within them. Her passion for ensuring equal opportunities has seen her partner with healthcare professionals in Nigeria to increase access to quality and affordable medicines for less rich people in the society. Arunala came to Australia in 2020 to pursue a PhD. She holds a bachelor's and master's in physiology from the University of Lagos, Nigeria. She's currently undertaking research in cardiovascular genomics as a PhD candidate at the Federation University of Australia. Welcome, Marie. <laughs> Dimitri Kojo Bavad. Most of us would know him simply as Dimitri. He arrived in Australia in summer of 2007 with one with only nine years of formal education in a French-speaking country. Since then, Dimitri has self-taught in English language to above professional working proficiency level. He holds a bachelor's and master's degrees in international relations from the Federation University and University of Melbourne, respectively, and is currently undertaking a master of social work and an MBA. Dimitri is currently the president of the Victorian Togolese Association, a former president of the Ballarat African Association, and a former vice chair of the Ballarat Regional Multicultural Council. Dimitri is the founder and director of Solution Aid International, an Australian registered charitable organization whose aim is to provide world-class education to so-called third world or developing countries. Welcome, Dimitri. Simon Sibet, one of our quiet high achievers in Ballarat. Simon is a Victorian public servant and a father of two who has lived in Ballarat for 10 years. He has been a tax investigator with the State Revenue Office for 10 years and was in the Australian Public Service as a Centrelink customer service advisor for the five years prior to that. Simon is an entrepreneur. He confounded he co-founded uh, the first on-demand food and beverage delivery service in Ballarat, with business currently operating in four states. Simon recently commenced an e-commerce business trading across Australia, North America, Japan, and the EU via third party platforms such as Amazon, eBay, and Etsy, etc. Simon, Simon has also volunteered for several organizations most notably the Australian Red Cross in Melbourne. You will hear more about him. Welcome, Simon. <laughs> Apollonia Yeromva, one of our very young, upcoming, skilled personnel. Apollo is a proud member of the Ballard community who hailed from Rwanda, East Africa. He learned the values and importance of Ubuntu from the Rwanda's conflict and genocide misfortunes that led him to enter refugee camp at age nine, including resilience and determination to succeed. He uses his resilience to contribute to Ballarat and Victoria's, Victoria's great community in the healthcare advocacy and volunteering in emergency services, including the Red Cross emergency services and SES Ballarat units where he assists uh, with responses to instances of single incident events, such as fire or accidental house damage, and working closely with DHHS to assist the affected persons or family with emergency relief, including package for their emergency accommodation. He also volunteers with the State Emergency Services Ballarat Unit and sometimes with Ambulance Victoria and Fire Brigades around Victoria during summer. Apo holds a Bachelor of Biomedical Science from Deakin University, where he majored in infectious and, immun infections and immunity. He is currently embarking on a master's degree program to study medical imaging sonography at Monash University. He is an active member of the Ballard African Association and hopes to continue to deploy his knowledge to help community members to improve their health, well-being, and vitality. Welcome, Apo.
Angela Bejimba. We call her the dynamite uh, within the group. Angela is ambitious, courageous, and diligent. A female deeply passionate about succeeding in life and educate others on issues that impact people in the community. As a young advocate, Angela uses her leadership skills to bring people together to build confidence, leadership, and great communication skills. Angela is an, inspire, an expired neurosurgeon doctor who is currently studying biomedical science at, Fed at Federation University. Furthermore, she's a member for the Ballarat Youth Council, where she has created a great impact by getting involved in projects that work towards improving women's safety, uh, discrimination, environment, and other challenges that people of all color, of color faces in the community. Angela has been involved with the Center for Multicultural Youth since 2016 as a shout out speaker, who has not only created a positive impact on children in high school, but also has also become a person that most children in the community look up to as role model. In 2019, Angela Bejimba was a facilitator at CMY Ballarat for uh, Lead Yourself, Lead Others program, where she facilitated a three-day training on ed educating young people on issues that women face, such as sexual harassment, gender violence, racism, and many others. Welcome, Angela. While our panelists uh, make themselves comfortable in their shares, um, during the lead up period to this event, we have got 14 questions that we'll be um, posing at the uh, panel, uh, members of our panel this morning. If there are any questions from the audience, um, could you please indicate by uh, a show of hand and organize to, uh, a microphone to yourself to ask your question. I um, would start though with the questions that we have got. We'll go around the table, starting from here, Constantine. Please tell us more about yourself. What brought you to Ballarat, Australia? Where did you come from? And do you like living here? And how has the population grown since you came? to see all of you here this uh, morning. And I'd like to say a very big thank you to Terry for that wonderful uh, speech. Um, I was actually very touched and moved by what he said and uh, really made me think a lot about who I am and you know what it means to be uh, a human being, really, and the challenges that we all face together. Anyway. We'll talk about it later, but I'm Constantine, originally born in Nigeria, West Africa. I've lived in Australia for, will be 18 years on the 1st of April. Come on, April Fool's Day. <laughs> uh, in 2003, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be, and I've lived in Ballarat for eight years. Sadly, we're finishing our time in Ballarat next month. Uh, we're moving to New South Wales uh, at the end of uh, April, but it's been wonderful. Uh, to spend eight years here. I've lived in different parts of Australia, in New South Wales, before Canberra, and Marimbula on the south coast of New South Wales. So uh, my impression of Australia is the vastness of Australia is only surpassed by the generosity of Australian people. And I've been very, very blessed uh, to have lived. Not with us, it's challenges. We all have challenges. I've had my moments of challenges, but um, I, I'm grateful to be. And Ballarat is great. It's a wonderful place. I love the lake. I love nature. I walk along a yarrow all the time and along the lake, and that's where I find my happy place. And uh, the culture, the diversity, the infrastructures, the uh, the buildings, the lake, the gardens, uh, the people. Uh, there's so many beautiful things about Ballarat that we will miss, but not the weather, though, not the cold winter. I must say. <laughs> uh, but apart from that, uh, we've loved living here. Our kids are born here, so Ballarat will always be. Uh, their hometown, and I'm sure in the future we'll bring them to to see where they're born. So the generosity of the people where they're born, the midwives, the doctors, we just have beautiful memories that will stay with us a lifetime. So I just want to, it's just wonderful to be here, and we've been very, very blessed to have lived in Ballarat, and thanks to all the wonderful people who have made it a special place for us. So thank you. <laughs> 
Tell us, Ari. Okay, so my name is Ariola Kinibos. It is Ariola, not Ariola. <laughs> All right, so I came to Ballarat last year, so I'm probably like a newbie. But it was um, interesting for me to come in at a time when um, there was a lockdown and people were facing their individual challenges. And just to see how people in Balabad opened up their arms to me and really have one more come from people that had their own stuff they were dealing with, you know, with the lockdown and all that. But for them going out of their way and just doing all they could to help me to be comfortable, I think it was a really, really good experience for me. And I'll always remember that experience in Balabad. And of course, I don't like the weather, but then I love the nature and I think I really love the people in Ballard. The fact that um, meeting people that usually would have no idea of what it means to be African or probably am um, their first African friend. And the way they just open up and are willing to learn, you know, just ask questions and all that. For me, that is a really good place to start from. And yeah, that's one of the good things about Ballard. Um, good morning, everyone. It's very good to be here. And, um, Thank you, Kerry, for that presentation. Um, I was very touched. And, um, I've got a lot of questions for you, but we'll save that for another time. <laughs> um, and thank you, um, Mel, for welcoming us here and, and all the audience. I uh, really appreciate um, you being here this morning. Um, I've been in Ballarat for 10 years now. I moved from Melbourne. And um, the first time, I remember the first time I visited Ballarat, it was a beautiful sunny day. Yeah, birds and butterflies around. <laughs> My wife is from Ballarat. She grew up here since she was a baby. She was adopted from Haiti. And so we came down, we met in Melbourne and we came down to Ballarat to um, meet her family and that. And it was such a beautiful day. I said to her, you know what, I, I think I could live here. <laughs> I was like, uh, I don't know if I want to do that. I got out of here for a reason. <laughs> but long story short, I uh, think since that first visit, maybe a few months later, I uh, made the decision to quit my job in Melbourne and uh, take up a job here with the State Revenue Office and move down to Ballarat. And we've lived here for the past 10 years, had our two kids here. And it's, it's a wonderful small town that I'm forever grateful for. You know, um, A few things that I could probably mention that really highlighted the University of Ballarat is, um, for instance, just the way that we, we were treated at the hospital, you know, when we had our kids, like, they just have fantastic stuff there, and, and people generally in town are very interested to know who you are, where you're from, and, and, and things like that. Obviously, we do look different from most people mm -hmm. in Ballarat, and I appreciate that people want to know more in that. Um, my wife had different experiences growing up here back in the 80s, 90s, and that as a dark person in Ballarat. But she, even her, she's like, it's, it's just like a different Ballarat, you know? Like, she remember as a child, she would walk, like, she would go around town and probably, like, the whole day she would only see one other person that's not white, <laughs> you know? But now she's like, there's like Asians, Africans, Indians, and, you know, and everyone living in harmony, she's here. Yeah. So, I definitely do appreciate um, Ballarat, Ballarat in, in general. Uh, there are moments that you know you probably don't, not very proud of, you know, to experience. But overall, I think it's a very lovely town, and I'm privileged to be here. Um, so before we move on to the next question, how will just uh, quickly describe how and why I moved to Ballarat. So I came to Australia in 2006 after 16 years of uh, work experience in uh, Nigeria. Um, note that I didn't say Africa, I said Nigeria. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I came for my master's and I was fortunate enough to um, be sponsored once I finished my master's for my PhD uh, to then begin to lecture in uh, Perth, Cotton University. Uh, from there, the industry pushed me um, to work in, the, uh, in Perth. And of course, uh, in 2013, uh, Gecko System won a contract to build Aurelia Gold, which was then YTC go, uh, mine. mine. Uh, but the condition uh, precedent was that they had to have somebody with extensive design experience, and that was, uh, that was me. Um, of course, the night I came for, when I came for my interview, I was lodged, I was fed. Uh, the entire management team came out to have dinner with me the evening uh, before my interview. 
Uh, of course, my, my, my response to the, uh, the interview was going to, be to accept the role. And uh, it was sold to me uh, clearly that Ballarat had one of the best schools in, 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 in Australia, which I found to be true. And since then, uh, we have moved, we moved to Ballarat and my family enjoyed it and loved it here. Uh, I have since then started my own business and, uh, when I finished that contract with them. Uh, we'll go back to the panel now. Um, we'll come to you, uh, Apo. Uh, you've got two lovely kids. What has it be, how has it been raising kids? Here in Ballarat. Well, thanks again for being here. And, uh, it's a privilege to be sitting in the environment always, John Joseph. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, to be in the footprints of uh, John and Sasha Joseph, uh, Joseph John, uh, to Maloney there, and uh, it's very good. Thank you. So raising kids here, um, depends on how I see but but is a very welcoming environment. Um, as an African, we're right here in, in our culture, normally the child is for the community, and um, the entire family is supposed to support you to raise those children, so to, you know, even if you know where they came from, it's not there anymore, so you are grandfather, grandmother, every. So um, the teachings and the networking of other parents have been um, sleepful from the rest. So they support them the most. So to have their kids, the children, that was the one that I would say called the kids here the most. And myself also, um, we had to work very hard um, finding services to and so having So I would say um, services around children here, they were very essential in helping us raising care and Thank you so very much. I'm looking at you, Dimitri, former president of BAA. How has your experience been raising children in Ballarat? Uh, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say thanks to all the community members present here um, from different cultural group that took interest in the uh, forum that we have today. It's the process of learning from each other, and I'm really pleased to see uh, the mayor here with us today as well. Um, this is what we want for Ballarat, and uh, it is only through this process that we will build a stronger and unbeatable community that Australia seems to be at the world stage. Um, going back to your question, uh, Dr. Michael. I'm just a young father of two, uh, three years old and uh, two years old. And I would say um, the reason why I have moved back to Ballarat, by the way, I've tried to escape Ballarat several times. <laughs> uh, I went and I spent at least two years in Perth, spent some time in Adelaide, I lived in Melbourne for two years, and somehow there I am again. And the reason why I came back is I think we have a very strong community here, mm -hmm. a respectful community, not only among Africans, but all communities as well. I arrived here um, over a decade ago, and so that way I engage with the community, and done a lot of activity, connected with other cultural groups, and um, I thought that we always um, been given time here in this community, and the support is there. We have the council taking leadership, in um, promoting multiculturalism in the forefront. And I think that's the one of the reasons why I think, well, this is a place to be if I want to raise my children. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Angela, I'll come to you now. How do you respond when um, people speak of uh, uh, African Australian community as coming from Africa as opposed to coming from particular countries in Africa? How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the uh, people generalizing Africa as though it were a country, as opposed to coming from, say, Nigeria, Malawi, Rwanda, for instance? Um, first of all, I always acknowledge that um, many, it's not everyone who travels in, in the world in particular. Um, and most of the times, 
people they merge into different things and when they merge when it comes to education and when they merge when you do that it doesn't mean that they have to know everything that is going around in the world um they can be more knowledgeable on certain points and that's how i take it as people here in barat when they actually ask me like hey do you speak africanese <laughs> <laughs> hey how is africa i i do take it as you know a person who is for example studying science or they don't know anything to do with politics you know because they're majoring into that so i take my time to educate them tell them that uh africa is the same as other continents for example america they do have north america south america and that's the same thing with africa we do have different countries congo malawi um zambia they actually have 54 countries if i'm not mistaken uh that's how africa is and i always encourage them that you know it's a great place to visit and if you want to go out there for a holiday i think africa one of the countries in africa might be a great place to visit and also to be able to go and learn the culture that african people have not yet translated here but going there you'll be able to explore more yeah that's good harala <laughs> You've been here with in, in Balarat for a year. How do you react to that? Oh. Okay, so initially when I came, it was a very strange concept to me and I used to be quite annoyed. Like, should I should have been to say, "Oh, you're from Africa." "Oh, I know someone from Africa." "Oh, Africa." I'm like, "Don't talk like you know <laughs> Africa just calm down." Because I am from Nigeria and Nigeria has over 250 ethnic groups. and i said only with two and really i would not even speak for other ethnic groups in nigeria because i know i know very little about their culture so listening to someone say oh i've traveled to africa i know everything about africa i'm like calm down <laughs> even within nigeria i can't boast to know everything about nigeria so i always really take the effort and time to tell them see i am from nigeria i don't even claim to know everything about nigeria and africa is not just um africa nigeria is in western africa i don't even know many of i've not been to many of the states and countries are in western africa i've not been to many of the states in nigeria so i don't claim to know i don't claim to speak for nigeria generally or even to speak for africa generally so you should understand that if i don't then maybe you should just try to make the effort to learn and know and say okay i've been to ethiopia i've been to south africa i was in johannesburg where have you been to then talk about your experience in that place because like i said earlier i've had a lot of experience with people in balawat it's been varied So I can't say that I know the way everybody in Balawat acts. I can't say that I speak for Balawat, but then I can say that oh the people that I have met this is the way they behave. So if you also want to talk about Africa, a particular country in Africa, try to be specific because Africa is not someone's back room. It is a continent. Thank you so very much for that. How come to you now Constantine? Um it's no news that the city of Balawat and in fact the government, state government um are doing a lot to promote multiculturalism um but they are not without uh some hills what do you think in your opinion that we can all do to promote interculturalism and this um integration learning of culture thank you michael um as we all know victoria actually is one of the most intercultural cities in australia multicultural cities if you prefer the term i think 50% of victorians are either born of the seas or have parents who are born of the seas and that's the statistics and we all know that and one of the ways we can do it i'm wearing the socks is australian flag socks and i'm wearing nigerian uh, <laughs> flag socks. so that's intercultural is i'm on the other but uh, I, i think uh just a side One of the ways we can do that is actually to learn to see the faces of people who are different. If you look at something to look at advertisement we have in Balaba, look at all the faces there. It's still very monocultural. Okay? We have to learn to see more diverse faces, to hear more diverse voices, to listen to more diverse voices. Okay? I really think that we have to realize there's a phrase in South Africa that says until I am heard and respected I am not seen until I am heard 
and respectful and loved, I am not seen. You can have all these statistics about how 50% of the parents are born overseas or have parents who are born overseas, but do we actually hear them, respect them, see them? Or is it just tokenism? On paper, we have Harmony Fest, we have this week where we all eat different foods and have entertainment. I don't think that's enough. We have to do more than that. We have to help people from diverse communities to be part of the process of how we create our politics, our culture, and the different aspects of our society. So the mayor, you're here in the city council, in the decision making, they say, if you want to change the conversation, you have to change the people at the table. If there are no people who are culturally diverse around the table in the town hall, I think we, the conversation is not going to change. We have to. And I want to ask everybody here, personally and individually, how do you think and see and act towards people who are different? Just ask yourself. Personally, because I believe the society reflects all of us. Look at the whole culture of the way we treat women. If you think that's all the parliament problem, you've got to be kidding. It is actually a reflection of the whole Australian society. So don't just blame MPs and the, and the prime minister. We tend in our society to uh, apportion blames and point fingers. I don't think that's enough. All of us here, we have to, as Gandhi said, be the change we want to see in our world. And it has to begin with you. It has to begin with you. It has to begin with what you say to your children, the comments you make, the passing comments you make about people who are different, all of that. But it also has to be institutionally, personally, structurally. So multicultural communities have to be part of a decision making, the way we structure our society and the way we live together. If they're not, it's just pure tokenism, okay? So let us ask ourselves, personally and institutionally, do we hear, do we see, do we respect, do we love people who are culturally diverse? And let's begin from there together. Thank you. Apo, you've got school-aged children. In light of what we've heard from Constantine, how can Ballarat schools engage with parents of students from diverse ethnic groups to improve lived experiences, schooling experiences, and outcomes for our children? So to solve that, that's the question Michael said. Um, it's one of the radical answers we have to come up with from down the teacher to see a child not treating a parent with content. Help that child invest, invest in that education fully. Um, there's a two things there. There is teacher working with a parent, and there is also the state working putting the resource there because as we treat each other with that harmony, it reduces that cost. I answered that part of as you said. So if we go to parents, I'll come back again to the culture, our culture as African, we respect a teacher because we believe a child is for the community, is not mine. If I send Kayla to Baninyong there, I'm not sending Kayla there because I know just the teacher.
teacher. I go there, I see the teacher, and I really appreciate and respect them because I believe truly believe I give them my job and it's there. That's the difference. For us, it's not just because it's a job. No, it's your child. We give you the child because we believe it's for the field. That child is for all of us. So um, if we can invest in the teachers to have that mindset that they are raising the child for the community, mm -hmm. um, we'll have that inclusive in all, not treating that, which means the teacher won't be treating the parents with contempt. Ah, they don't care, no, they care. They gave you just a different culture, a different way. So I believe taking that little investment will help the teacher come back to the community, serving by raising the children for the community, and also in the meantime, reducing that cost, costing all of us by having that harmony because we care for all of those children. That's if I must just follow it. Thank you so very much. <laughs> It was interesting recently, uh, the papers uh, published a news about Shepparton High uh, School in Shepparton, where the government uh, is pumping uh, a large sum of money as an investment to improve outcomes at the school. Now, the first questions I asked was, how, what does their board actually look like? Uh, it's high time we all stopped the notion of uh, thinking that mere investment, spending more money will actually solve the problems. If we do not have uh, the will to become culturally competent, culturally intelligent, and culturally aware, no matter how much you spend, those monies will just be in, uh, just be in vain, and the problems will just be recycled year in, year out. Thank you so very much for that, Apo. I would pause at this point to see if there are any questions from the audience before we continue. That's very good. Thank you so very much. <laughs> yes, please. Surum, Surum, Sidamali, thank you for having this forum. And certainly it's enlightening to hear. Uh, I think I want to pick on uh, uh, Father Constantine's uh, comments. Uh, yes, we have to be you know, part of the structural system. We have to be part of the decision table in order to make the changes. But sometimes you find that I'm going to talk very bluntly and openly. We have been valorized. Sometimes we have, there are people who are supporting to see that diversity improved, to see that opportunity should be given. But then there are people who are holding it back. Okay? How do we create a pathway to let someone, you know, reach the table before this person's voice can be heard? You know, that's a question. Thank you. So does anybody in the audience want to answer that or we attempt that here? Um, well, all right, go for it. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, just adding up to what uh, Sudan has said, um, even though we're living in a, a community that embraces multiculturalism, uh, many organizations are just approaching it from a cosmetic perspective. Uh, that's a culture that I need to change uh, because the benefit of having a multicultural workforce is well documented and um, yeah, all organizations need to be encouraged um, to start implementing those. And just like Father Constant mentioned earlier, if you wanted to change the dynamism, you wanted to change the culture, you have to change sometimes the people. Mm -hmm. And having that the cultural um, balance is actually necessary on our staff, on staff of organization, on boards, 
on the board of directors. Yeah. It has to happen. And recently, I was working on a project uh, with the Council of Youth Service. And um, I've asked whether we are allowed to include um, international students as part of this project. Uh, I don't want to mention the name of the project, but it's a project that's you know, usually designed for um, nationals and residents. And I raised the point that most of the international students that we have in Colorado, and I know many, they end up becoming a resident. Why should we not include them as earlier rather than letting it, letting it to the later stage when they become residents or when they start building family before um, to foster or to encourage that inclusion? So I think it's something that we have to start um, you know, in the early stage in all forums, in all organizations, and educating um, employers and organizations to take that on board is really paramount. I, mean, I would like to add to that education really is important. Mm -hmm. But Terry said something that I really made a note of. He said, we have to take one step at a time. We have to persevere. I think about our indigenous people. They've been here for over 60,000 years. And even after 60,000 years, they're not even recognized in our constitution. Isn't that sad? Really sad. Okay? But they're still fighting. You know? But you can tell that the community perspectives are changing. There's probably more uh, people now open to that in the society than before. It will take time, but it requires education. It requires that we persevere, that we keep working together with like-minded people. That's how you change culture. We keep modeling to our young people, but with time, I think it will happen. So it has to be all of those things. As I said, with indigenous people, it took them all this while but they're still fighting. So we have to. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight, but we have to persevere. Yeah. Quick short one from Apple, and then we move on. Uh, I think we need to start uh, to recognize this diversity without taking people in contempt. Stop treating minority people yeah, in that contentious behavior. It's toxic. I would say this. Because it's the first step. Include those parents in a border school, for instance. They will make that decision for that child. They will make that decision that will involve the entire, actually, the entire school. It's simple. Something just to include something, be inclusive. That's, that will work. That will, will engage with even other members of the community before even. The blink of the eye, we see things start, start changing, and that that's one step I would say in the city, like that. And as slow we grow, we we'll give that example, and yeah, we we'll start having that harmony as we do with our all together. Thank you, Sonora. I love the question and your uh, your candor in the way you asked the question. Uh, there is need for self determination. We've got to create a platform, an opportunity for people and uh, cultural groups to become self-determined. I'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, to become self-determined. Uh, we've, we've got to facilitate their development. Uh, we've got to stop the unfeeding, the spoon-feeding <coughs> mentality and orientation that we have by way of holding on to projects or policies. We've got to allow people to actually become um, people that can determine and co-create and co-design their future. Otherwise, the, the, our, the future of the children that we are building will be in jeopardy. Um, there's this concept of equality modified equity. Yes, we believe in equity. My story is that of equity. I fight, I have fought for everything I have, I, have, I have earned. In fact, I do tell people I have not won a lot in my life. Even Raffle, I haven't won one until last Sunday. Which was a different, which was different, <laughs> honestly. Until I said, which was different. But the truth is, I believe in in equity, but we've got to create that environment, that opportunity for people to become self determined, for them to have a voice at the tables, for them to actually be present at the table, not just being there by by talking where they just rubber stamp your decisions, but then to actually be present and participate and be heard and be seen. Yes, please. Some 
own family to be safe is it showed that they still had the idea that, for example, I think the Aboriginal is a minority group, which to me is a little bit odd because I think mm. they're not a minority because so many of them died and their health is poor. They're actually a majority in the past. Yeah. So it's as though because they're, they think they're a smaller group, they're not as important and they don't get as much airplay in them. Mm. So I had an elderly student who's from New Guinea and he said to me one day that he took, he, he took a dog, it was a friend's dog, he took the dog for a walk at the, the lake, as a lot of them do, and he had a friend with him, but someone stopped him and accused him of stealing the dog. Now, I don't know if he accused him of stealing the dog, whether he saw both the boys, or maybe it wasn't their dog, I just thought it was a strange thing to go and accuse someone of taking the dog. I don't know why she thought that it wasn't, because I just didn't think there might be pockets of racism or people that are suspicious, maybe in different generations. But does anyone find that there might be a sign of the people that don't say anything that they feel that they could be holding some negativity towards those what they say is otherness? Mm. Now, that was an important question. Uh, do you want to speak to the item of orders? All the way. Yes, I can. Um, John Powell um, said that the problem of othering uh, is the uh, greatest issue of the 21st century. Uh, we make other people other. I don't use the word racism. I use the word othering uh, because racism is only about race. But othering, we all do that. Okay, You make other people other because of their color, because of their gender, because of their socioeconomic background and different other reasons why we do that. But I think it's important for us to understand that there are really no others. And I will quote this to you. The foreigner disappears when all acknowledge ourselves as foreigners. This is amazing. The other disappears when we all see ourselves as others. Okay, so our challenge is really to live and work in a way where we don't make others other. In Africa, we have the concept of Ubuntu, which says, I am because we are. The person who tells that person that they stole that dog, if they had seen their humanity in that person, they wouldn't do that. Often, othering is because of fear of the other. Okay? So let us, all of us, and I say this all the time, Global peace must begin with me. We must destroy in other people. We must destroy in ourselves what we want to destroy in other people. There is a bit of othering in each and every one of us. Maybe we can begin with ourselves. Okay, Ballarat harmony begins with me. If I don't other people for whatever reason, and you don't, there will be a more collective Ballarat. Okay, we have this small we and then the big we. Let's include everybody. And that's why I'm here, that's why we do this, is we want a, a Ballarat that's socially transformed, where everybody is included and no one is left out. Because if we do leave anybody out, then we're diminished as a result. That's really part of why we're doing this. So thank you. I, I think it's really the problem of othering. Uh, and it's everywhere. I see it. People sometimes ask you questions, you know where they're coming from. Sometimes people are unconscious about this. I do it myself. I'm a recipient of it. But we have to be more aware of it. And we have to try and root out in ourselves what we want to destroy in other people. Thank you so very much. And now, in, in concluding that, I think it is an, this is a discussion opener. Um, we open the discussion now. It will continue. Uh, it's high time for politicians to um, not only look at the numbers game. You know, in game theory, numbers theory, you, you do policy settings for the majority of the people. Now, but on our side, we come together as an alliance uh, and showcase, amplify our voice as a collective. So at least we can matter in that numbers game, in that game's theory. Thank you so very much for that. Now, we'll go around the table and briefly tell us what you as an individual what you have contributed in Ballarat and to Australia. Simon. Yeah, um, I think um, 
from a personal perspective, there's a lot of contributions that I've um, you know, um, brought into Ballarat. Just my being here, I think, has contributed to Ballarat's uh, image of multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's true. It's, um, I think that's probably my biggest one. <laughs> but no, I um, obviously, um, I've, I've got family here and, and my two kids go to school here. My wife and I work here and, and we contribute to the economy that way. But um, um, I think um, one of the biggest things really, I think or, or the most important thing in a small regional town like, like Ballarat is the economy really, you know, we, we, don't, we, we have a small pool of uh, talent uh, in, in a small town and um, to be able to provide a way that, um, that there'll be more people earning in the, in the, in the city, I think that's um, a, a big thing and that's what my company with, uh, with the delivery business uh, does in Ballarat. Um, we, we employ a number of people here in Ballarat um, and, and Bendigo, probably our biggest areas where we employ people and and we pay um, you know, in, in excess of half a billion dollars a year in, 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 in workers' pay and that. So when I, when, I, when I think of myself as being an, an immigrant in Australia um, and, 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 and here in Ballarat, my interactions with, with the general public, um, the first thing that somebody will, will kind of the first thing that comes to mind is they see the African, you know. I, I feel like sometimes, and, and this is not in malice or anything like that, you know, but I feel like sometimes, uh, first of all, I'm seen as the African guy, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk, and suddenly there's renewed interest mm -hmm. in me as the person, as Simon, and, and, and things like that, you know, mm -hmm. which I do understand. Again, it doesn't come from a bad um, place or anything like that. But my contribution in, in another way would be to educate the, the people that I come in contact with, the people I interact with on a daily basis, and, um, and just let them know that I, I, I am an individual. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a black guy, an African guy. I, I am Simon. I, I have my likes and dislikes, and, and, and I contribute certain um, things to the society that I'm a part of, and that's how I want to be seen, and that's how I want to be recognized and, and, and interacted with in, in that um, manner, you know, because I feel like myself and other fellow African and, 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 and multicultural individuals here in Ballarat do contribute a lot to this city, and the city's been great, but we just need more education. We, we need more awareness raised um, around who we are as, as a different culture in Ballarat. I don't want my kids to only know Africa from watching World Vision ads and mm. think that's what black mm. people are, you know? Mm. We are more than that. Thank you so very much for that, Simon. Certainly having a payroll um, balance sheet as, high, as much as half a million in a year is a huge contribution to Ballarat. We'll come to you now, Arela. Thank you. Well, um, for me, like I said, I'm a newbie, <laughs> but even in that time, um, interacting with other international students and um, dealing, um, seeing people that feel like because their skin color is different, you know, people are treating them differently, that probably they shouldn't even be in the course they are in. And probably they don't speak the way they should be speaking and just helping them through that process where um, they are all of a sudden for the first time in their life beginning to question their existence actually just because of the interactions they are having with people at school and in the community. You know, so just having that time with them to talk to them and say like, see, I'm also experiencing the same thing, but then it doesn't help that I go back into my shell and feel like I'm not enough just because of what another person is saying. But I'm reminding myself of the person that I am and helping them also through that process. Because it's not my fault that they think the way they think, but then I also do not help them to let them go on thinking like that because it would also impact other people in that way. So actually for me, it's been working with international students um, within, um, around me and helping them through that journey, even as I'm also you know, going through that journey myself. Thank you so very much. And secondly, your PhD research in cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular genomics is illuminating and shedding more light on how we can improve well-being. Isn't it? Yes, it is. 
Thank you. Constantine, we'll come to you. I, I feel very uncomfortable about answering that question because <laughs> uh, you feel as if you're blowing your trumpet. But I'll tell you two stories that probably illustrate. I'm a priest. Um, that's the main thing, an Anglican priest. Yesterday afternoon, um, at about 2 o'clock, I went to Kelaston and stayed with a friend of mine. He called me uh, on Wednesday to say his wife was dying. And I went that Wednesday to see her and the daughter. And yesterday, actually, I called him. He thought, oh, I thought it was your day off. And how come? I said, no, it's not my day off. I'm working. I went and spent about 30 minutes with him and the wife. Uh, prayed with him, comforted him. And I knew that the end wasn't far uh, for, for his wife. And she's only young, 71. You won't believe it. At 9 o'clock last night, he sent a message to say the wife had died. Okay, And he's Aussie and the wife is Aussie. And I went to bed last night, so, I mean, I was sad, but I was very happy and grateful that I was able to help this man at the most critical moment of his life to help him find some sort of comfort as he, you know, was holding his wife's hand as she died. That to me, there's no amount of money that you can quantify that, but moments like that as a priest is what really uh, keeps me going. And from there, I went to Langikak at the prison. And I had 14 prisoners at Langikaka yesterday. We celebrated the Eucharist and we talked. And, and whenever I go there, I say to them, every day here, yeah, the system reminds you of what you've done. But when I come, I want to remind you of who you are. Mm -hmm. I don't condone what you've done. You have moral responsibility. But I also want to help you to remember who you are so that you can change and become better. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that does for them, but I think those two stories probably help illustrate where I find my own purpose and passion and meaning as a priest and what I contribute uh, in people's lives. That is not monetary value, but maybe something that helps them find comfort and peace and healing and, uh, and meaning uh, in moments like being in prison or when someone they love uh, is about to die. So anyway, that's, that's <laughs> a little bit of my question. Angela. Um, thank you. That's a good question. Uh, so, me coming to Australia, I came here in 2016. Ever since I came here, people in Geelong or people here might know me as a person who is always in the community. I'm a student who is doing science, but I'm very passionate about helping out in the community. Being in Geelong, ever since I was there, it was always about volunteering. I have volunteered places where even now I don't even remember if I volunteered right there. But when they see me, they're like, oh, Angie, you remember you came to volunteer with the aged care facility? Oh, you remember you came with, to volunteer for this other event? Just knowing how much work I've put out there in the community, not actually expecting money or anything, it's really great and it makes me feel good that, yeah, I'm really contributing to the country of Australia. Not because it's something that I, that I have to and money afterwards, but because I'm willing to. And I know that the outcome is to have students, like how you say in the bio, that students look up to me and think that I'm the best and they want to become like me. Just having that in the community, it, it brings joy to me. And it, it's a fulfillment of knowing that, yeah, I'm doing great and I'm really contributing to the country. Thank you so very much. And I do know- Paul here has been a volunteer um, to several agencies and organizations in Ballarat for some time now. Um, I'll allow you to share very briefly what your experiences have been in those contributor, uh, contributing roles. At ACA, it's already first. first. Uh, wow. Yeah. Um, in Ballarat, for instance, last year, um, where we had to, to go and fire an incident after a beast, um, yeah, that was hard. I was on call. I was having classes as well. So I had to put the phone and my pager here and waiting any time just to intervene here in Barat because most of the team was deviated up there. We had only one car here. So as uh, being ready to just be called for a tree or fall a tree, block a tree somewhere, um, or a house fire to support uh, CFA here, a uh, single incident in an accident because we collaborate in that area as well. Um, yeah, it gave me that sense of 
saying I have that heart of being ready only for the community or being there, I have that little hand to give. So it gives me a little bit of sense of belonging, sense of being at home, I'm supporting my home where I am. And yeah, that's, that's what I can say. Um, I don't earn anything, it's just I give time. And I think, yeah, my simple two hands, I just, just go and cut the tree and remove it from the road. It's, <laughs> uh, it seems, it seems easy as we say, but I have to put on a blue light when I'm driving. It's a high speed. It's a little bit of risky. But yes, that's, I'm a boy. I'm dry. So, <laughs> uh, Dimitri. Uh, well, I think it is a good question, as Thomas has said. A little bit uncomfortable to answer. But I will try to answer it from other people's perspective. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we have to learn as well to see uh, the society we live in, in the, through the view of an ecosystem. You know, uh, everyone contributes in one way or another. Uh, it is a story of a lady who asked um, uh, yeah, people to come and get rid of uh, some sort of uh, insect that she was having around the house. And they came and get rid of the, 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 the insects. And later on, she found out that the termite was, the termite were eating the house alive. Mm -hmm. And uh, without knowing that the insects that they destroyed first eat the termite. Mm -hmm. And you know, the couple people say, well, you know, the termite are eating my house alive. And they say, well, the insect that we destroyed actually we fight the termite. They said, no, bring the insect back. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's the view of seeing sometimes the multicultural community as um, taking advantage of the system is something that we need to, to review because we all contribute to the ecosystem in a different way. But talking about me personally, I've done quite a lot since I've arrived here in Australia and my contribution to the community has been recognized by the council through several um, certificate of appreciation. Um, Kind of uh, done a lot of projects with young people as well in the past. Uh, Enemy the Youth Award back in 2010, and uh, the recognition from the Victoria Multicultural Council back in 2012. Um, I can keep going on. And the volunteering that we all put into the community is a very significant part of the contribution of our multicultural society. Uh, this harmony fest, for instance, we have a lot of con community that have delved in to organize things for the community, just to raise awareness, to help us to learn how to love each other. It is a contribution that we could not quantify, and we have to learn to appreciate those, I think, mm -hmm. in, the, in the right value. Thank you so much. very much. I just had quick, very quickly, um, like I mentioned uh, earlier on, I hold a number of patents. Uh, I came to Ballarat to help uh, the ecosystem executive project. Uh, it was uh, a multi-million dollar project in the devout of 50 million. Um, I, did, I did help them a lot. Uh, but currently, more recently, um, I had um, a project demo that could have been anywhere else in Australia. It could have been in Victoria, could have been in Queensland. But I chose to actually demonstrate that product here in Ballarat, to put Ballarat on the map. And by virtue of that, Ballarat is known, um, have, at least it contributed to being known uh, even more widely in Europe, in America, uh, because the product was to be used by law enforcement agents. Um, the OECD city in Netherlands called me to discuss it, and they mentioned Ballarat in their reports, as well as in the US. And that's a number of things um, that I have contributed, and I know a number of our community members that are doing similar things. Um, Simon, for instance, uh, has a payroll in excess of uh, half a million. I know a number of my community members that are doing similar things, but the only thing is I don't have permission to share their stories. Um, like, we ha like we all do in here in Australia, it's privacy reasons. So until we have that platform to continually share stories like this, the wider community will probably not know what we are doing and how we are actually contributing. So that, that is why this event is so important. And thank you to the council for actually giving us this platform. Lastly, before we go, 
I will just ask uh, a few of the panel members, what do you envisage for Ballarat in 10 years? I'll start from you, um, Ariola. Thank you for that. Um, 10 years is, <laughs> is a long time, but then it's a short time. And for me, it's interesting to hear people talk about how um, either their own past experience or other people's past experience, how they feel that Ballarat was actually not um, culturally diverse and how it's grown up to this point. But then I know that there's still so much to come in the future. It's going to be a place where not just physically it will be culturally diverse, but even um, in people's mind, the way they react with other people, they're able to actually give people that space of equity and able to relate to people on the basis of who they are, regardless of what they look like or where they come from or what their background is, but to actually be able to appreciate them for who they are and what they can contribute to the society. Thank you so very much. I think Sam. Uh, um, I would love to say Balaram being... Um, just one Ballarat, really, you know, um, regardless of the cultural differences that people have. Um, and, and, I do, and I strongly believe that would be the case. Just in the 10 years alone that I've lived here in Ballarat, I've seen so much change, and so many things that are completely different from what I, you know, apart from the ge geographical changes where the city's just grown and, and that. But even just the general interactions between um, people um, of, of different backgrounds, but I also hope to see that in, in, in 10 years, hopefully, the formation of the, of the, um, of the governing bodies in Ballarat and industry in general are a lot more welcoming and diverse in, in, in the voices that represent the city. You know? mm -hmm. um, I definitely want to see a, a lot of multiculturalism in the council, for instance, you know? <laughs> and, and things like that. And no, I don't want to run. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah, thank you so very much. Have been uh, at a tender uh, meeting, wanted to sign a contract, and the only thing that stood between me and uh, and winning that contract or well, signing that contract or progressing it was because I'm an African man. That hurt me so much. Mm -hmm. Leaving that office that that day, knowing that I missed that contract from being progressed because I am an African man. In ten years, I would love to see my boys and my daughter living a society where the color of their skin would not mitigate their opportunities, where the color of their skin would not um, necessarily mean they have lesser opportunities, but where we all live in harmony, where we all live in unity, and we are brothers and sisters. After all, we're all spun from the same canvas. Mm -hmm. With that, I want to thank the panelists, I want to thank the audience, and I want to thank the City of Ballarat, Eureka Center, uh, for allowing us space to stage this uh, event has been wonderful. Thank you so very much, everybody.